This podcast is made possible by you, the supporters of WPLN and WNXP, Nashville Public Radio. This is the Nash Villager Podcast. It's October 30th, 2024. On this day in 1938, Orson Welles scared the pants off a whole lot of people. His radio drama adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel, War of the Worlds, was broadcast nationwide, and it played out in the form of a series of fake news bulletins that sounded all too real. People who tuned in midway through did not hear the introduction that made it clear the show was a work of fiction. To them, it really sounded like actual reports of space aliens from Mars invading New Jersey. Reading accounts of how War of the World came together, I'm struck by the speed of it all. Orson Welles' team settled on the idea of adapting the novel just a week before the broadcast, and he was busy with another, bigger project. So there wasn't exactly the most robust editing process. The legal team at CBS did look over the script, but they were mainly just concerned to make sure no businesses were mentioned in a way that might lead to a libel suit. Nobody seems to have considered that little touches like casting an actor with a really great FDR impersonation to play the role of the fictional president might come off too real. The next day, newspapers across the U.S. carried front-page stories of people panicked by what they'd heard and reassuring readers that the Martian invasion was not real. And while it may not have been his goal to truly fool so many people, Orson Welles never really seemed too disappointed with the mass panic that ensued. I'm Nina Cardona, and this is your Daily Digest of what's happening around Middle Tennessee from Nashville Public Radio, WPLN News. The War of the Worlds hysteria was a definite lesson for the broadcast industry. There is power in any content or product that gets that kind of mass distribution. We've got to be careful in how we present things to make clear what is fact and what is fiction. Now, I wish I could say that every broadcast news entity still took that seriously. I think we all have our doubts, to say the least, about some. I've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks sitting at the bedside of a family member who likes to have cable news on all the time. And let's just say it's definitely given me a lot to think about in terms of journalism, the standards of this industry, and the continued power of the press. So now seems like a good time to pull back the curtain a little bit and tell you how things work in the WPLN newsroom. Our goal here, day in and day out, is to place an emphasis on turning out reporting that is nuanced, fact-based, and most importantly, community-driven. We focus on the big picture. There's a difference in quality and importance between news reports that do little more than scare you about a situation that is highly unusual and individual, and one that shines a light on the way things are going in the community as a whole. We're always going to push for that second category. We place a high value on revealing systemic issues and telling the stories of the people working to fix them. Our reporters question people and institutions that are in power and elevate the voices of people most impacted. The underlying thought through everything we do here is that there's a real value in connecting the dots. And our hope is that you walk away from our coverage feeling that we've contextualized the news of the day in a way that deepens your understanding and empowers you to get involved in the larger community. As for the nuts and bolts of how that happens, well, as our newsroom has grown, we have been able to really invest in a strong core of editors. These are people whose voices you don't hear as often, but they work hand-in-hand with reporters to plan coverage, to think through the way each story is told, and then to carefully check each draft to make sure the news we're sharing is accurate, understandable, and engaging. In some cases, for major investigations, WPLN reporters like Mariba Knight or Paige Flager work with outside organizations like ProPublica, NPR, or the Serial Podcast team to tap into an even more robust crew of folks like editors and fact checkers. More and more, our reporters specialize in beats, like Caroline Eggers working exclusively on environmental stories, Catherine Sweeney focusing on health care, or Cynthia Abrams covering Metro government. That means they can become experts in their subject areas. 
When a government official issues some kind of statement that pertains to their beat, they already know the context and can hit the ground running. And they're also in a great position to recognize and cut through the BS when someone's trying to spin things in a way that's less than truthful. And we're reading everyone else's reporting, too. That's part of my job as the local host of Morning Edition. Every day after I look through the reports that are ready for air from our own team, I also look at all the other news outlets around town to see what they're saying. Partly that's to see if there's anything we missed, but it's also to get a sense of what their reporters picked up on in stories that we all covered. Because as hard as we try to get the full story ourselves, there's always that chance that someone else noticed another detail that's also important. And we're always interested in rounding out our coverage so that what makes it to your ears is the most complete and most relevant as we can make it. In just a few minutes, an investigation into the ways children are affected by a state law meant to head off mass violence in schools. That's coming up after the newscast. Nashville Public Radio is always here to keep you informed, whether it's the latest news or music you should check out. Every week, What Wear Wednesday shares the latest happenings taking place right here in Nashville by talking to members of our community, putting on events in your neighborhood and beyond. So tune in to What Wear Wednesdays every Wednesday, and you can always find events at wnxp.org slash events. For WPLN News in Nashville, I'm Tony Gonzalez. Last year, more than 500 children in Tennessee were charged with making threats of mass violence against schools. Since then, the state has ratcheted up the punishments, making it a felony charge, even for kids. A WPLN and ProPublica investigation out today finds that law enforcement is arresting kids over jokes, rumors, and misunderstandings. Representative Bo Mitchell, a Nashville Democrat who co-sponsored the felony law, acknowledges that some children who do not pose any danger are being arrested, but he said that prosecutors and judges should use good judgment about how far to take a case. Matt Moore, a defense lawyer in West Tennessee, says the stakes for children are too high to rely on the discretion of individual prosecutors and judges. The whole point is these are juveniles. They're supposed to make mistakes. They're supposed to be young and dumb. And if you don't have a judge who or a district attorney who take that into account, you, these kids' lives are basically over. Several lawsuits in the state have stemmed from the threats of mass violence law, including one in Williamson County that alleges a high schooler was handcuffed, taken to juvenile detention, and strip searched before being placed in solitary confinement. He was held for three days. The school board disputed some of the facts of the lawsuit in a court filing in early October, writing that the students' comments and actions warranted discipline. A district spokesperson declined to answer further questions about pending litigation. Election Day is a week away for the majority of Nashvillians, but for those inside Davidson County's jails, Tuesday was the big day. WPLN's Mariana Bacchial reports from the downtown detention center. The visitation rooms have become makeshift voting booths with poll workers walking voters through the process two at a time. This is your ballot that you will... Fill out, okay, the instructions at the top, just one of these. Check one. Yeah, just check one. The last day to vote for people in jail comes a week before Election Day. And voter turnout has been higher this year. Every election, it increases in voter participation. That's Carla Tina Hampton. She's been working since the start of the year to give incarcerated Nashvillians the resources to vote. Everybody has the right to vote, whether you're incarcerated or not. Everybody is just one step away from being incarcerated. One speeding ticket or accident can mean the difference between casting your ballot in jail or at your polling place, Hampton says. At the downtown detention center, there's a mix of first-time and long-time voters. I've been voting since I was uh, 18. I try to keep it it constant, constant because it's the right. If we want to hear people hear our voices, we have to vote. For another voter in line, it's his first time casting a ballot. Because even though I'm in where I'm at, I'm still able to vote because I'm not feeling so it feels good. Roughly 70 people are voting at five facilities across Nashville. Mariana Bacchial, WPLN News. Nashville's fire department rescued a person who climbed the arch of the Korean Veterans Bridge on Tuesday afternoon. 
The agency says the person became stranded and was ultimately rescued using a ladder truck and connected with mental health counselors. It was only last month that a man climbed the same bridge and was coaxed down by first responders. Experiments with AI tools have become a regular news generator for the music industry. Senior music writer Julie Height reports that in the new old-fashioned way, one of the most popular holiday tunes around the world has finally been translated into a different language. Brenda Lee was famously just 13 when she recorded Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree in Nashville in 1958. And now, in the AI era, the 66-year-old track has finally been re-released in Spanish. No, Lee didn't perfect her Spanish fluency and re-record it. Producer Audio Bacado used an AI model that had been trained on her original vocals to replace them with identical-sounding singing in a new language. The rest of the track was kept intact. Lee and her record label MCA Nashville approved the new version, and that was a notable move. Her label is part of Universal Music Group, and UMG has sued companies for unauthorized uses of its copyrighted material, while at the same time forging partnerships with others to train their AI models. Julie Height, Nashville Public Radio. Business leaders in Tennessee are feeling good about the economy and better than they have in the past three years. That's according to the latest business barometer survey from Middle Tennessee State University. They've been checking with companies in the state since 2015. Business leaders are most concerned about a potential recession and about inflation. However, they remain overall substantially more optimistic than Tennessee consumers. And as Nashvillians head to the pumpkin patch ahead of Halloween this week, They are sure to see some large pumpkins. However, and as Nashvillians head to the pumpkin patch ahead of Halloween this week, they are sure to see some large pumpkins. However, Tennessee is far from pumpkin growing prowess nationwide. The Indiana Pumpkin Growers Association surveyed all states, Canadian provinces, and some countries for their largest pumpkins on record. Of the 69 areas studied, Tennessee's largest pumpkin ranked the state 44th. That's largely the work of just one man, Jason Terry. WKRN reports that of Tennessee's top 10 list of heaviest pumpkins ever grown, Terry has produced eight. Last year, he achieved the state record, weighing in at 1,846 pounds. You'll find more news anytime at WPLN.org. After the Covenant School shooting, lawmakers wanted to make punishments harsher for people making threats of mass violence at school. They made it a felony charge, regardless of if the threat is credible. The law has caused chaos with schools, law enforcement, and judges acting on the law in different, often conflicting ways. And children are being caught in the middle. Across the state, kids as young as seven are being ensnared in the justice system over jokes, rumors, and misunderstandings. WPLN's criminal justice reporter Paige Flager and ProPublica's children and families reporter Aaliyah Swaby have this story from East Tennessee. In late September, Tori was driving down the highway in Chattanooga with her 11-year-old son, Junior, when her phone started to ring. So I answered, and it was the officer. The sheriff's deputy, who worked at Junior's middle school, Arthur Richardson. And he said, hey, Tori, are you at home? She told him they were headed to a family birthday party at the Longhorn Steakhouse. And he said, is Junior with you? And that immediately made Tori feel uneasy. She tried to set the feeling aside when they sat down to dinner with family. But then her phone rang again. It was the officer. This time, he was outside in the parking lot. Can you tell me what do you want? And he said, I need to talk to Junior. Tori went outside, and that's when the officer told her. We're coming to arrest him. In Tori's memory, everything that happened next is a blur. Junior's stepdad, Kevin Boyer, was on speakerphone. Both parents pleaded with the officer. They told him Junior's autistic. He would feel claustrophobic in the back of the cop car, especially in handcuffs. Could they just drive him to the detention center themselves? There's no reason for you to put bracelets on an 11-year-old. He doesn't understand. But it didn't work. So Tori went inside to get Junior, holding back tears as she tried to explain what was happening. 
Kevin heard his son crying and started to give him a pep talk. Like, hey, listen, they got it wrong. I'm on my way down to the, to the jail and I will not leave until you come home with us. But you have to, you, you, you have to go with them, okay? Just let them take you. Family members spilled into the parking lot. Junior's five-year-old brother was sobbing. They watched as Deputy Richardson put handcuffs on the 11-year-old and locked him in the back of his patrol car. He claimed, according to the police report, that a state law required him to take Junior away. Paige and I have been digging into this state law. What we found is that the adults in charge are scrambling to figure out how to apply it. Principals are forced to involve police in minor incidents they would normally handle themselves, while law enforcement arrests kids who likely don't pose a real danger. Judges are having to sort through a flood of cases they feel never should have ended up in their courtrooms. And kids like Junior are being handcuffed for statements that wouldn't even get them expelled. And the lawmakers who passed this law told us it was meant to stop hoax threats, essentially by scaring kids. Cameron Sexton, Tennessee House Speaker and the Republican sponsor of the law, said his legislation is working exactly as he intended. Uh, They're going to go after the students. I mean, unfortunately, sometimes you have to make examples of the first few um, who are doing it so that others know that it's going to be taken seriously. And maybe the students will stop um, doing the hoax or trying to cut a joke or be funny because there's nothing funny about it. Yet juvenile defense lawyers, judges, school officials and parents criticize the felony law for casting too wide a net unnecessarily traumatizing kids for being kids. The incident that plunged Junior into the juvenile justice system happened in the last hour of the day at his Chattanooga Middle School. Junior was in his favorite class. Science. I think it's just the best one out of all of them. Yeah. He overheard two other students talking to each other. He said that one student asked the other if he was going to shoot up the school. Junior looked at the other student, and he looked like he was going to say yes. So Junior answered for him. He said, yes. According to the police report, the other kids went to the teacher and told her that Junior said he was going to shoot up the school. Junior denies ever having said that. He doesn't have access to guns at home. It was the type of misunderstanding that before might have been sorted out by the teacher or a school counselor, But under Tennessee law, school staff have to report threats to law enforcement. If they don't, they could be charged with a misdemeanor. Hamilton County Schools didn't respond to questions about Junior's case and sent an email saying they try to work with law enforcement to handle threats of mass violence. Junior was called to the principal's office, along with the school resource deputy, Richardson. Tori joined them when she picked him up from school. Junior answered some questions, which Tori felt cleared things up. She asked the principal if Junior could come to class tomorrow. She said, oh, he can attend school as if he was not a threat. Um, No hesitation, she said that. That's why it was so surprising to the family when the school resource officer, Richardson, tracked Junior down hours later to arrest him. Junior's parents filed a citizen's complaint against Richardson saying that he arrested their son on hearsay and wanted glory for making the arrest. That investigation is ongoing. And under the law, it didn't matter that Junior didn't have access to guns or that he was allowed to come to school the next day. Law enforcement doesn't have to consider those things before making an arrest. Richardson didn't reply to requests for comment, But Junior's stepdad did record a phone conversation he had with Richardson's boss, Lieutenant Jeremy Durham. I know y'all don't really know Deputy Richardson. He he was not out to get anybody. None of us like doing this. There's no there's no high five or big honor in putting a child in jail. There's just not. Durham said he reviewed camera footage of the arrest and thought Richardson did not violate policy by arresting Junior. They're just trying to enforce the law, he said. We do have some, we do have discretion, but it puts a little bit more burden 
all of that be when it is a felony, especially one uh, like threats of mass violence on school. Durham didn't respond to our requests for comment. The Hamilton County School District investigated 38 threats from students in the first month and a half of school. That includes finger guns pointed at other classmates and remarks about burning down the classroom. One fourth grader was hit with a soccer ball at recess and angrily told students he would blow up the school. Police arrested 18 kids. But school officials labeled most of the threats as low level, with no evidence of motive. The students arrested were more likely to be black and have disabilities, like Junior, compared to the district's overall student population. And the kids who were arrested, even on low-level threats, were taken to the Hamilton County Detention Center. That's where Junior was transported on the night of the arrest. He was placed in a room that had a window visible to the waiting room, so he could see his stepdad. You know, I'm waving at him. Uh, He's giving me the thumbs up, like, I'm okay. And I was like, I told you, I'm not going anywhere. But Kevin started to worry that the detention center might try to hold Junior overnight. When he asked an employee, he found out that they couldn't. Junior was actually too young to stay at the facility at all. So all of this is unnecessary. Putting the handcuffs on the kid, um, like like just this whole show that you guys are trying to, to, to have, you're not even gonna accept the 11 year old. Once Richardson finished writing his report, Junior was free to go. Junior's case is scheduled to go to court in December. Because it's a felony, he could be looking at more time in detention in a state facility. Robert Filia is the juvenile court judge in Hamilton County and has seen many of these cases this year. For example, one one youngster, very young, held up a battery and called it a bomb. You know, that was enough to get him arrested. Another one uttered the words, I'm going to nuke the place. You know, he didn't have any plutonium in his backpack or anything. But he was arrested. Law enforcement feels like they have no choice but to arrest and take him to juvenile court and then let others sort it out. Let others sort it out. Judges like Philia are acting as safety nets at the end of a long, harsh, punitive process. For example, in Knox County, When the district attorney requested to detain all kids charged with threats for up to 30 days, judges said no. And judges are rarely finding kids delinquent, which is like being found guilty in adult court. So after all of that, about 80 percent of young people charged with threats statewide have been given diversion or had their charges completely dropped. It was a chilly night in early October when we met up with the family for football practice. And this field is his place. Uh, He's the gentle giant of the field. When Junior isn't playing football, he's talking about it. Uh, I play linemen. I think I like about it is like, like you got to block the man in front of you on offense, but defense, you got to try to get someone who ever got the ball. Junior was suspended from school and extracurriculars like football for two days after the arrest. But sitting high up in the bleachers, his parents say the consequences of his arrest have lasted much longer. I think when I look at Junior and I see that he don't want to talk about it, I think that it's painful and he just kind of wanted to just dissipate. Little by little, Junior said, it's gotten easier for him to sit in the classroom of the teacher who reported him to the police and to walk past the officer who handcuffed him and put him in the back of a cop car. But his parents still don't know who to blame. Do you fault the officer? Do you fault the new law? Um, Who takes responsibility of, hey, okay, this is a massive problem and we're traumatizing our kids now? We're traumatizing our children. He doesn't know what the solution is to stop the threats in schools. But he says arresting kids like his son can't be it. Paige Flager and Aaliyah Swaby, WPLN News.
Hundreds of children across the country are facing charges this year similar to juniors, especially after a deadly school shooting in Georgia this September fueled a frenzied response. School officials and law enforcement reported immediate increases in the number of school threats on social media and vowed to crack down on anyone making them. Representative Bo Mitchell, a Democrat from Nashville and one of the co-sponsors of the law, said people, including children, need to be punished for making threats. We're trying to stop the people who should know better from doing this. And if they do do it, they should have uh, more than a smack on the wrist. Maybe if they sat in a jail cell for a little while, they will not play with their phone or their email anymore and threaten our children. Tennessee has not yet released statewide data on how many arrests for threats of mass violence have been made since the school year started. But Hamilton County, where Junior lives, arrested more than twice as many kids in the first six weeks of school as Davidson County, despite Hamilton having far fewer students. We do this roundup of Nashville news every weekday. So subscribe in your favorite podcasting app to make sure you never miss an episode. And if you like this, you'll probably enjoy the Nash Villager newsletter, too. You'll get perspective from more of my colleagues at Nashville Public Radio and links to the stories we're following. Sign up for those daily emails at WPLN.org slash Nash Villager. And that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. Let's make this day a good one. And we'll catch back up tomorrow.